Yeah, and that brings me uh, to the main event uh, of, of today uh, that we have all been waiting for, of course. And uh, that's a lecture by uh, Professor Wolfgang Black from uh, Aachen University, uh, the Steel Institute. I think uh, he needs a little introduction because anyone who has been in the field of steel research has encountered uh, or seen uh, his work before. Um, so without uh, any further delay, um, I would like to uh, just mention the topic and then move over to uh, Professor Black. So he will give us a lecture about uh, some uh, particular findings on microstructures and mechanical properties of advanced high strength uh, steels. Professor Black, the floor is yours. Okay, Eric, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Perfect. Perfect. Now you should mention the trick how to enlarge the, the picture. Uh, in, in my case, it already uh, automatically happened, but uh, you can uh, also uh, press the screen. Okay. And then um, uh, pin this, uh, this, this, uh, this picture that you see now of uh, Professor Black. Okay, perfect. So, yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, sorry for the title of the lecture. It's hardly a meaningful title for a scientific lecture, but when I accepted uh, to give this talk, uh, I was not really knowing what to talk about. So it was a more general title, but nevertheless, uh, the last word at least is meaningful. It's about steels. And um, that's already is one of the critical features. So, some particular findings on microstructure and mechanical properties of advanced high strength steels. Steels is the problem because we have a history of 4,000 years. We have a tremendous steel production. So, I took it in kilogram. It's 1 trillion kilogram per year. Uh, or 1.6 trillion kilogram per year, 1.6 billion tons per year. And within the European steel register, we have more than 2,500 different grades. And if you look how to develop these steels with many different properties, it's always the same story. We take a chemical composition, we have a specific type of processing, then we aim for properties. And finally, we aim for the performance of a component. And being a material scientist, of course, there's something in between, there's the microstructure and the nanostructure, and we claim that we can characterize and manipulate this structure. Okay, so that's the good part of the story. The more critical part is, of course, um, do we have really a demand for new steels? And do we have new ideas for new iron-based materials? And being a material scientist by education and by profession, of course, uh, the answer is very simple. It's yes, two times yes. And I think um, we look now not necessarily for new properties, but we look for a balance of new properties, especially a balance of strength ductility, strength formability, strength fatigue. We have a continuing driving force with respect to cost and many People, especially the Americans, think that cost is the most important property of steel. And coming along, we have a green steel uh, development. Uh, and we will ask, what is the CO2 emission of steels? And that will also change the future demand for new steel and uh, processing goods. So in total, uh, this is, in short, my talk. Uh, two times yes uh, for new materials and new ideas. If you're not satisfied with this very short answer, then maybe you should follow me for the next 45 minutes. Uh, I would like to start with the story of the advanced high strength steels, because I think this is a big story of success for steel development. Or oh, excuse me, something happened with my automatic computer system here. Um, this is a big story of success on one hand, and on the other hand, uh, it's also a little bit uh, storytelling because we are close to Christmas and um, that's the right time in the year to tell some stories. And this story is about sheet steels for the automotive industry. 
Now, uh, it's clear what is the background. There's a very strong intermaterial competition on one hand. On the other hand, we need to develop materials for mass production of a very complex consumer product, and we have to meet a multitude of requirements. And at the end of the day, that resulted in a great variety of different steel grades. And we can take the steel grades, and we can also see that they are divided into different classes, into the class of mild steel and high strength steels, conventional high strength steel, and into the group of advanced high strength steels, first, second, and third generation. And my talk will be about this storyline, about the advanced high strength steels. But I would like to start how it really started in the beginning. What was the original idea? What was the first nucleus for the development of these advanced high strength steels? And uh, therefore, we have to look for the processing route of sheet steels. Of course, we start typically with continuous casting, hot rolling, pickling, cold rolling, and then we distinguish between batch annealing and continuous annealing. And the batch annealing was state of the art 40 years ago. It was a standard annealing process for mild and for high strength steels. And you see, you put several coils in a stack, top on the other one. And um, that requires a long time for annealing and quite a big space for the different annealing furnaces and cooling covers that you need. And then a new development showed up in Japan. And that was a very specific Japanese type of development because after the Second World War, completely new steel plants were planned in Japan in the 1970s. And there was a new characteristic, 12 million tons per year, which was very huge at that time. So the classical size was around about 5 million tons per year. And there was a focus on flat products, not all products in one plant, but a specific focus on this uh, very demanding uh, product form. At the same time, it was a Japanese situation that there was a shortage on industrial ground. So the plants had to be built on reclaimed land, and that was very expensive. And the Japanese climate is characterized by high humidity, so they had a lot of rust problems during coal storage in uh, the multiple steps of coal producing in a cold rolling mill. So there was a search for new technologies, and one of the developments that came up at that time was the CAPL couple continuous annealing and processing lines, the start of continuous annealing for sheet steels for deep drawing. And these continuous annealing lines, and here is an artist uh, photograph of a continuous, of a quite modern continuous annealing line, was characterized by high investment cost. And unfortunately, on top of that, also on high processing costs, much higher than the processing in batch annealing type furnaces. And so the search for value added product starts. Are there any products that can be produced in these continuous annealing lines that can earn more money than the conventional processed products? So we have to compare the specifics of batch annealing and continuous annealing. And here you see the uh, annealing cycles on one hand, you need up to four days. On the other hand, you need just a few minutes to produce uh, the um, final coil. And uh, the options for new steel grades are characterized on one hand by high annealing temperatures. So you could use very high temperatures for recrystallization. So you will be able to recrystallize also high alloyed materials on one hand. At the same time, you could use very high annealing temperatures up to the intercritical or even to the austenitic range. You have accelerated cooling. And you have a second annealing step that can be used for controlled aging or for partitioning, as I will explain later on. And so that was indeed the starting point of the development of many new products, bake hardening steels, dual phase steels, frip steels, quench and partitioning steels. So it was the process first, and then people looked for the proper materials that can be produced in this process. 
And that also brought about the interest in one of the traditional alloying elements in steel, the interest in manganese. So the iron manganese system is quite well known. Manganese and iron are neighbors in the periodic table. But if you look for the observed phase diagram, you notice that there is a strong delay of the phase transformations and that there are many different possible low temperature phase transformations in uh, high manganese alloyed materials. And these low temperature phase transformation causes some interest and gives a chance for developing new steels. And that is based on an alloying element that is quite common, that is used for long, and that is quite cheap and can be, for example, used by ferromanganese. So if we look for the further development, then we notice that uh, all the advanced high strength steels that we discussed today, first generation, second generation, third generation, are characterized by relatively high manganese contents. So this table is, a, or this graph is a little bit horrible because we took on the y-axis, the eco-index, ultimate tensile strength times elongation, gigapascal times percent, so whatever that means. But nevertheless, it's one parameter that describes to some extent the performance of a material, performance of a steel. And uh, so the state of the art indeed is uh, a parameter for the eco index 10 gigapascal times percent. So that's round about state of the art. And the advanced high strength steels first generation offer the option up to maybe 20 gigapascal. And then we have the second generation and these are austenitic steels. The austenite content is given in these arrows above. So here we have 100% austenite. And these austenitic steels can be divided in different groups in trip and trip steels and also more modern in MBIP microband induced plasticity steels. Uh, stacking fault energy becomes an important parameter, but the overall performance, and that's the reason why I take this graph is around about 80, it's, uh, or it's up to 80, it's times four times better than the overall performance of our current state-of-the-art technology. And somewhere in between is a compromise, a compromise with respect to alloying content. Um, so also for saving money, uh, the advanced high strength steel third generations, and here we have the medium manganese steels, MNNS, the crunch and partitioning steels, um, which we will discuss later on. Now, uh, this as a first introduction to advanced high strength steels, and then we can ask, well, what is there? What is the definition? What is the characterized uh, feature of an advanced high strength steel? And um, we can uh, ask the World Auto Steel Group, uh, the advanced high strength steels application guidelines, and the use for the conventional high strength steels, conventional HSLA steels are single phase ferritic steels with a potential for some perlite in carbon manganese steels. And for advanced high strength steels, they claim these are multi-phase microstructures with phases other than ferrite, perlite, and cementite. And they produce unique mechanical properties. So this is not a very strict scientific definition. Uh, it's more or less a marketing issue. And it's a marketing issue to show that the strength ductility balance is better than what has been seen beforehand. And uh, the term has been invented by an uh, um, uh, American colleague of us, uh, Divanchi Bhattacharji, of uh, former Inland Steel to the ArcelorMittal. And it became very pro um, popular everywhere in the world. And uh, excuse me. No. So it's too many buttons I can push. So that's a little bit of a problem. Okay. Uh, term became very popular. And this graph became also popular as well. This is the graph. Uh, sometimes addressed as banana diagram because it shows the inverse relationship between formability and strength. 
and in compare mild steel, high strength steels, and the different groups of advanced high strength steels. And I put in it as additional information what is the matrix. It's a ferritic multiphase matrix, or it's an austenitic steel, or it's an austenitic multiphase matrix. Now, that's the introduction. That has been uh, not a fairy tale, but it's a little bit storytelling uh, for the end of the year. And now we come to some um, selected results that I would like to share with you and that I consider to be interesting with the respect of the development of new steels. And I start with the advanced high strength steels first generation, the cold formable sheet steels. Uh, they are typically characterized by multi-phase microstructures. Uh, we have high strength and ductility, as already mentioned. Uh, very often, we have a very pronounced strain hardening and some bake hardening. And uh, the physical principles is that we use phase transformation to combine different microstructural features. We have a nanoscale microstructure, and sometimes we have small contents of metastable retained austenite. And that has resulted in different steel grades. And all these steel grades are characterized by um, specific metallographic pictures. They are shown here in, um, in a schematic graph. And I would like to draw your attention, especially to the dual phase material and to the complex phase material because these are the most prominent um, examples for advanced high strength steels first generation. I mentioned that this has been a success story and a success usually is not a matter of material scientists, at least not of material scientists alone, but it's a matter of bringing the material to the customer. And one of the big uh, ideas to do that with advanced high strength steels was the ULSA consortium, Ultralight Steel Auto Body Consortium, an international project of 33 steel companies joining to develop uh, an all steel car body in the competition with uh, plastics or with aluminum car bodies. So uh, especially the second project of this consortium, the ultralight steel auto body advanced vehicle concept used industrially producible steel. They used modern steels. Uh, target was lightweight and crash performance. And in 2002, there was the final report. And one picture of this report became really important for the steel development. And you see this start diagram, it's a very simple picture. It's showing the share of different steel grids in the future car body. And you see three quarters, 74% should be made from dual phase steel. That has not become true for some reasons, but nevertheless, at that time, it was a real uh, wake up call because everybody became aware there's a new group of materials and this new group of materials is expected to have an extraordinary um, uh, possibility for future application. So everybody tried to produce uh, dual phase steels. Everybody was happy to have dual phase steels. Unfortunately, uh, there were also some problems which were not foreseen in the beginning. And if you look for the strain distribution in a, in a sheet uh, deformed in a forming limit diagram test, uh, you see the difference between the DP, the dual phase material and two other materials, strip and trip steel. And characteristic for the dual phase material is the localization of strain. And this localization of strain was not considered to be a problem in the beginning because nobody was really looking uh, at this topic because the, what we discussed today as global and local formability at that time was not considered to be a critical issue because if you look for mild steel, if you have an excellent global formability, for example, uh, shown by total elongation, you also have an excellent local formability, for example, shown by hole expansion or minimum bending radius. But with respect to the advanced high strength steel, suddenly these topics became to be distinguished. And so we had the dual phase material, and you can read much faster than I can speak. So with a high global formability, and we have the complex phase steel with a high local formability. 
And we have the drip steel, which unfortunately is a little bit expensive. And so this is only used as the ultimate ratio when uh, DP and CP fail. So dual phase and complex phase steels have to be considered. And if we compare the microstructures, we see a very well-defined microstructure in a dual phase steel, a ferritic matrix and some martensite islands, five to 25 per volume percent. And the complex phase steel, you see, yeah, frankly speaking, you see nothing. It's uh, a mixture of many different uh, issues and it's very difficult to explain what you can really see here and what you can quantitatively describe. The best approach to quantitative description is the EBSD electron backscatter diffraction approach. And here we can try to identify the different phases and which is done here in a study for DP800, um, CP800 and CP1000. So two complex phase steels, one dual phase steel. You see the different um, attributions to martensite, bainite, ferrite, austenite and cementite. And we try to determine uh, the volume fraction, uh, the grain size or grain size parameters, uh, aspect ratio. Um, and uh, this is a possible way to describe the microstructure. But unfortunately, this is not extremely successful when we look for microstructure property relationships. Especially if we look for local formability, this type of description seems not to be extremely helpful. And therefore, we tried another one, uh, or we tried several other ones, but one I would like to introduce here, and that is the nano indentation method with XPM mode. XPM means accelerated property mapper. And um, here we take a grid uh, that is predefined, and we take a very shallow indentation depth uh, and a very small distance between the indentation depths of just 300 nanometer. And so we can do an automatic indentation mapping with 40,000 indents within 24 hours. And so we get a second information. We get a first information by the EBSD measurement. Here we can try to identify a phase map. And we get a second information that we call hardness map. And if we compare both, we notice that both are not really identical because we can identify phases like uh, green is uh, bainite, and that uh, shows many different types of hardness within this phase that we address as bainite. Maybe martensite can be uh, determined uh, without ambiguity, but uh, ferrite and bainite is quite difficult to describe. So if we take the hardness mapping, we have an alternative approach to describe the microstructure. And if we do that, we get characteristic hardness distribution for the DP800, for the CP800, and for the CP1000. And uh, if you look in detail, uh, the uh, average hardness of a DP800 and a CP1000 um, is uh, quite obvious. So here we have a hardness of uh, more than six gigapascal. And if you look for the uh, DP800, you have an average hardness for the ferrite, which is quite small, but for the martensite, which is slightly above that. Um, but uh, the um, average hardness of the DP800 and the CP800, for example, are more or less uh, the same. In the final um, column here, you see a word that is well known to any engineer, so every engineer, the entropy. But I have to say, this is not the thermodynamic entropy. This is another type of entropy, the Shannon entropy, that has been introduced um, many years ago by Claude Shannon in information theory. And it's a parameter that describes the expectation of a specific um, uh, parameter that you measure with respect to a given distribution function. And it can result between zero and one. And if we try to describe the different hardness distributions that we notice in our hardness mapping, then we have different options to adjust this type of uh, Shannon equation. And at the end of the day, we get entropy values and we get a relationship between the whole expansion ratio. So 
We notice that the Schoen entropy, or here is called the hardness entropy, depends on the number of classes. And this reflects to some extent the data spread. We uh, see characteristic differences between the steels. And uh, even if we apply different uh, boundary conditions, we show a very good tendency for the coincidence of the entropy with whole expansion ratio. So we think uh, what we describe here is the gradient within the microstructure. And uh, this type of gradient description, there are also some alternative methods to do so, seems to be more important than to identify individual phases or phase volume fractions. I would like to a second example of advanced high strength steels first generation and switch to forging steels. Forging industry is quite an important industry in Europe. Here you see some characteristic production figures uh, for the uh, um, dye forging industry. You see also CO2 emissions. And um, so it makes sense to take care of forged products and whether there are alternatives in processing and alternatives in uh, materials design for the forging industry, which has been neglected for a long time. The process in the forging industry is quite uh, a long processing route, including several heat treatments. And these heat treatments, to some extent, are characteristic for the forging process route. And if we look for these heat treatments on uh, the right hand uh, top side of this graph, you see that uh, there's a forging, hardening, and tempering treatment in the traditional way. And the controlled cooling from the forge heat helps to avoid additional hardening and tempering treatments. And so that is one of the challenges for the future to develop steels for this controlled cooling from the forge sheet. That is a process that already started um, th 30 years ago with the uh, what we call uh, AFP steels, um, it's precipitation hardening steels. But if you look for the table, you see a little bit the tendency uh, from the reference material, which is the 42 chromatinum steel, to the latest developments in uh, uh, Benetic, in trip, and in air hardening steels. So it's a tendency in manganese content. The manganese content is increasing. It's a tendency in carbon content. The carbon content decreases and we use microalloying elements. Now the storyline can be explained with a very traditional old figure where we distinguish uh, the tensile strength of a steel as a function of the temperature of phase transformation. And you see, we can distinguish between the ferritic perlitic steel with uh, the, um, I have to look where to move uh, with the benetic steels and with the um, martensitic steels. And uh, in order to improve the, um, the ferritic perlitic steel, uh, we can minimize the perlite lamellar spacing. We add some uh, precipitates and we minimize uh, the ferrite fraction. The new approach is to use benetic steel. And these benetic steels uh, are typically benetic ferrite. Uh, they contain some retained austenite and we try to reduce the carbide fraction. And that has developed, uh, come along with the development of a new benetic steel that we call HDB, high strength ductile benetic steel. And this has already become a uh, large scale production product. If we go a step further, we can develop um, a trip steel that contains some retained austenite in order to especially improve the toughness behavior. We use the trip effect, transformation induced plasticity. And the background of this development is uh, shown here once again in the table. So what I already explained, uh, we look for the manganese and the carbon content mainly and some micro -loying. And then we see what is the development job. Uh, if you look for the left-hand picture, we have the FATT, the fat 
transition temperature, fracture appearance transition temperature as a function of the heat input or transformation temperature. And you see it's a wavy curve with several minima. The upper curve is for high carbon contents, the lower curve for low carbon contents. And as the uh, transition temperature should be as low as possible, you see that we have to look for low carbon content and for uh, low transformation temperatures. So that's a clear uh, job, uh, how to develop the right binitic structure. And uh, on the right-hand side, um, you see the ferrite less widths, sorry for the very short, uh, very small figures here, ferrite less widths as a function of the transformation temperature. And you see uh, this also is uh, showing some scatter, especially when we have somewhat higher transformation temperatures, but that can be controlled by the alloying content and especially by the alloying elements that control the austenite grain size, the prior austenite grain size, and also the transformation kinetics. And uh, finally, this should result in an extremely fine and homogeneous binitic structure. And uh, one of my of the previous speakers in the this lecture series, Harry Banesha, he called that uh, uh, the uh, nano size, the nano benite. And this has become a very popular expression to describe this development of benetic steels uh, recently. There's a, another trick that we can use in these nano benetic steels. That is, that we uh, have to observe some um, partitioning. And if you look for the importance of the different alloying elements that is listed up uh, in the list uh, above, you see also that we result in a specific chemical distribution of the elements. Uh, the chromium and the silicon contents seem to be more or less stable over the length scale of a few micrometer. But you see that there is a pronounced partitioning of carbon. And what was quite surprising when the nano benite steels had been developed also with respect to manganese. And uh, this type of partitioning can be used to control it in a way that some retained austenite is developed. And if we adjust the stability of the retained austenite, uh, this will give us uh, the chance to use the transformation induced plasticity effect. We know that this effect is um, very prominent in uh, stop, uh, stopping of cracks for high toughness materials. And indeed, we consider um, that by this trip effect, we can develop some damage tolerant steels. And I have to explain this uh, a little bit complex figure um, step by step. So what we uh, did here, we used it. Um, steels that has been processed uh, industrially or on a laboratory scale, on a large laboratory scale for two wheels, and then the two wheels were tested. And um, the, um, uh, the clear lines, blue and red, describe the behavior of um, the undamaged uh, examples. So without any scratches, we have seen that our um, uh, trip steel, which is called here hypercom steel, according to the project uh, which we use to develop the steel, um, is more or less the same level of probability of failure as a function of number of revolutions to failure. There's a, there's a small shift to the left, um, but uh, that's not considered to be critical because we compare industrial processing and laboratory processing. But if you come to pre-damaged by scratch samples, then we see that there is a tremendous shift. So in a, uh, with respect to damage tolerance, the trip effect works out to be very effective and that can be used indeed also for future steel development. This is one of the issues that is still discussed with industrial partners. Unfortunately, especially the trip microstructures are a little bit critical with respect to be processed in the forging industry, because the forging industry is quite a rough um, environment. So you have the forming, you have the cooling, and uh, the cooling section is not extremely good controlled. So you collect uh, in some boxes. And uh, at the end of the day, you have to produce uh, 
uh, samples with uh, small size and with very large size. And so you have to meet the microstructure uh, for many different possible um, temperature time schedules. And we did this and we tried to uh, develop a somewhat um, temperature tolerant material. And uh, this has been done also on industrial scale and you see many different cooling variants that has been used. It's no need uh, to memorize that because the result is very easy. Um, irrespective of the cooling variant, we always get the same properties. The mechanical properties are insensitive to cooling conditions. And that has been obtained by air hardening benetic steels. Uh, and in other terms, these are medium manganese steels with a manganese content of around about 4%, 4 or 5%. There's a second issue that becomes interesting with respect to these steels. They are not only insensitive to the specific annealing cycle and the processing cycle, but they also obviously show some benefits with respect to um, fatigue. And here we once again compared the uh, reference material 42 chromolyptinum 4 with an air hardening steel, medium manganese steel LHD. And you see that especially for the um, fatigue life, we get a significant improvement. And uh, so we consider that to be very attractive for high cycle fatigue behavior. To sum up a little bit this part, uh, the forging steels can be distinguished according to their toughness and to their uh, strength level. And uh, so we started with crunch and tempered steels as a reference and AFP, so the uh, ferritic politic strength, uh, precipitation hardening steels. Uh, in the beginning, then we developed some modified uh, precipitation strengthening. I did not discuss that here, but we developed ductile benetic steels. We developed trip steels with especially improvement in uh, toughness. And we developed hardening steels, air hardening steels that can be um, considered as easy processing materials because you can use the same type of material for small, for large components and on different processing lines. Now, leaving the forging industry, coming back to um, another group of materials, the medium manganese steels, uh, already had a first mention of that when we discussed this air hardening steel. In general, uh, we consider that the advanced high strength steel third generation have a manganese content around about between three and 10%. Sometimes we use some silicon and aluminum additions. And one common feature for all these steels is that we use partitioning. So we have typically different grain size distribution. We have some partitioning of carbon and sometimes of manganese, and we can develop trip or trip effects. Uh, so we can use um, uh, transformation induced plasticity or twinning induced plasticity. Many different steels are discussed. And one further common feature for all these steels is that uh, typically they require a very complex processing. Here you see the classical temperature time cycle for the partitioning treatment with uh, high, alloying temp high annealing temperatures, fast cooling to interstep temperatures and reheating for partitioning temperature. That's complex processing. And um, so we asked ourselves, what is the issue with these medium manganese steels? What happens when we add these high manganese contents, sometimes high aluminum contents? And how can that fit into uh, existing processing lines? And one of the main features to, to start a processing line is, of course, to solidify the material. And we take a test uh, sample in our institute where we use um, an in situ melting solidification uh, test. We take a quite large sample and then we have a thermocouple and an induction coil and we uh, melt the center of the sample. And this is uh, held in position by an aluminum oxide tube and a ceramic hose. And um, then we solidify the material, we cool it down to the test temperature and we test um, at different uh, param with different parameters at a defined temperature. 
And uh, the result is as follows. We see uh, typically uh, tensile stress and a reduction in area as a function of the test temperature. The red line is the tensile stress temperature. The black line is the reduction of the area, which is more important in this test. And we identify the solidification conditions with respect to segregation phenomena. And then we look for the um, strengths and the uh, toughness uh, at uh, different test temperatures. And that is important to control the continuous casting in the strand shell during the solidification treatment in the mold, but also especially in the straightening section of a con continuous casting machine. And if we do that for medium manganese steels, we get this result. Many different materials, many different tests had been carried out, but please consider first uh, for the green line that is considered the minimum um, uh, formability, the minimum reduction of a rear that is necessary in a, the straightening section of a continuous casting machine. And uh, if you then look for the black line, that is a carbon steel C30 conventional steel that can be easily processed. And we have taken different medium manganese steels as a comparison. And it comes along that some of the medium manganese steels seems to be uncritical, most probably can be easily processed in uh, existing continuous annealing lines, but some are considered to be critical, and especially uh, the red um, dots here are considered to be critical. And these are aluminum alloy medium manganese steels. And if we look for the microstructure, or here it's uh, not the microstructure, it's a structure of the fracture surface, we notice that we have uh, in the six manganese steels, uh, pure manganese material, manganese sulfides as we expected to be uh, relative important for the toughness at high temperatures. But uh, if we look for the additionally aluminum alloy and silicon alloy material, we notice quite large aluminum nitrides. And in the vicinity of the aluminum nitrides, uh, a variety of very irregular shaped manganese sulfides. That can be seen also here. So we have relatively few, relatively large manganese sulfides in the six manganese steels. And in the other material, we get this large variety of different precipitates, especially also of these um, regular shaped aluminum nitrides. And that is due to different solidification conditions. Complex figure, we start on the right-hand side. Mm. Uh, so 6% manganese steel, uh, we have the um, solidification temperature and we move from left to right and we see the um, austenite solidification. It's a pure austenitic uh, structure what we observe here and we see the temperature range for the manganese sulfides. If we go for the silicon aluminum added material, we have around about the same uh, zero ductility temperature, but we start now with a ferritic solidification. And uh, we have a very wide range of aluminum nitride precipitation, especially also at very high temperatures. And that is considered to be a very critical feature. Um, and that a steel designer has to be aware of when we develop high aluminum steels, we have to be aware what is the type of solidification, what are the type of um, precipitates that occur at quite high temperatures. And to sum up, uh, in this material, in this investigation study, we identified a typical range for bending and strength and uh, straightening in a um, continuous casting machine. And we noticed that um, um, there are two materials that do not meet the required 30% reduction of a rear minimum. And these are the aluminum containing materials. And therefore we get at least one recipe if we would like to go ahead with high manganese steels, be aware of um, what happens at very high temperatures during continuous casting.
In most cases, we do not discuss these high temperatures as a material scientist. We discuss the behavior during uh, low temperature processing and especially the quenching partitioning treatment. So that uh, is a very uh, attractive treatment on one hand, because it can develop a nano-sized microstructure with different types of uh, extremely fine martensite with different carbon contents, and that results in perfect mechanical properties, and that has been shown in many publications. Um, unfortunately, this material has to be processed, and a typical processing machine for this would be a continuous annealing line, or more likely a continuous annealing galvanizing line. And that's the layout of a classical continuous annealing line uh, that is available in many places in the world. Now, if we have to adjust new annealing cycles because of quenching partitioning steels or some other new ideas that we got for steel development, then we take a high demand on the flexibility of a continuous galvanizing line. So we have many different maximum annealing temperatures and especially this uh, post-treatment after the accelerated cooling becomes a critical issue because we have to reheat it and we have to stop sometimes the cooling at specific temperatures, uh, not at room temperature, but above that, that is not that easy. So there are many new annealing cycles that require a strict temperature time control. And this is necessary because with respect to these different annealing cycles, we notice we can develop many different grain morphologies. Uh, we can control the austenite uh, amount, and we have an um, uh, intersection of austenite reversion of microstructural recrystallization, and uh, that results with two ultra-fine grain microstructures with a lot of different morphologies. Coming back to my processing point, this would result in constructing new hot dip galvanizing lines with specific cooling sections, with partitioning sections, with inductive reheating, with heating soaking sections for heating above 900 centigrade, and because of the high manganese contents, also with some pre-oxidation furnaces to control the, the surface quality. That's a big issue because uh, that takes a lot of investment cost. And uh, these industrial processing lines are not as flexible as we would expect that when we only discuss materials on the laboratory level. So we should also look for alternative production routes. And I would like to take one of these production routes uh, shown here as an example. Um, it's production for medium manganese steels. The manganese content is around about 7%. Uh, low carbon content. And uh, we have a hot forging and a rough hot rolling section. And then we compare hot rolling and cold rolling with warmer rolling. So the blue line, hot rolling, cold rolling, with the warm rolling and the yellow line. Afterwards, there might be some intercritical annealing or intercritical annealing plus tempering. The material, 7% manganese, and we investigated for some reasons, high amounts of copper and high amounts of nickel. So one grade is zero copper, zero nickel. The other one, 1 1.5 nickel, 1 1.5 copper. Many different processing routes. It's too complex to explain everything in detail, but my point is, check we have warm rolled material, and we have warm rolled annealed and tempered material and cold rolled annealed and tempered material to take the most important features. And the first feature is, what is the austenite volume fraction that we obtain? For the cold rolled material, we need the annealing and tempering to develop a fraction of 20 to 33% uh, retained austenite as determined by synchrotron measurements. For the warm rolled material, we get an even higher fraction without annealing, just only by warm rolling. And so we learned that copper nickel affects the austenite fraction, but we also learned that just warm rolling is sufficient to develop a very high amount of 
uh, retained austenite, what is typically the target for these fields. Then we look for the chemical, uh, for the mechanical properties. And if we compare once again, uh, the warm root condition, that is the green line. And we look, for example, for the warm rolled and annealed, and for the cold rolled and uh, annealed and tempered, we see that the mechanical properties are not that significant different. You can also see that in the right hand picture where we had the total elongation, yield strength, and tensile strength. So we get more or less the same level of properties. Um, the only reason that uh, after cold rolling we get somewhat higher yield strength values is due to the copper precipitation hardening. But that's a very specific effect that's only sometimes is used. So we get a very attractive short processing just by warm rolling. Another feature comes up and that brings about new ideas because we see that we have some partitioning. We have partitioning of manganese, upper line, and of carbon. And you see that after warm rolling, the left hand picture, and of our uh, cold uh, warm rolling and kneading treatment or our cold rolling and kneading treatment, we get different patterns for the partition. Especially the carbon pattern can be adjusted quite different in a different way if we uh, avoid the additional kneading treatment. So we could suppress uh, the carbon partitioning. The manganese partitioning uh, is more or less a result already of the pre-processing, especially also of the segregation during casting. But here we can also see that uh, we can develop different schedules, different lines for the warm road or for the cold road processing line. And on top of that, if we measure uh, the, uh, um, the dislocation density by line broadening of synchrotron measurements, uh, we can identify that after warm roading, we can keep a specific level of precipitation of dislocation density inside the material. So what we learned from that is that by new types of processing, especially with these medium manganese steels, we have many new options uh, that we sometimes have seen for the first time. And we have to consider what are the possible combinations of these uh, options and how they will develop in properties. Now, coming to the last point, high manganese steels. There is a lot of literature now on high manganese steels and we have run a collaborative research center here in Aachen on uh, high manganese steels, uh, advanced high strength steels, second generation. These are austenitic steels with very high manganese contents. And uh, so one of the features is that they develop the trip or the trip or the MBIP effect. And that's, uh, of course, uh, interesting. And uh, that relies on the uh, different uh, transformations that occur, either the, the transformation to martensite, it's epsilon martensite in the beginning, or the development of um, uh, a large multitude of twin boundaries. But these steels are very high alloyed, and that causes some new questions. And the first question uh, that I would like to raise is, a uh, very traditional question indeed. Uh, where is CAM located in these high manganese alloys? And uh, the result is shown here. It's a uh, result of an up uh, supercell calculation. And it shows the enthalpy difference between different uh, octahedral gaps, which is filled within carbon atom. White is uh, the manganese atoms, the red are the iron atoms. And you see there's a clear tendency the manganese surrounded octahedral gap shows a significant lower enthalpy than the uh, iron octahedral gap. So we expect that manganese is looking for the, uh, that carbon is looking for the manganese atoms. That's not really new indeed. <clears throat> but uh, now we can try to answer why that's the case. And uh, the Apinicio people said, well, there's a chance that there is a stronger bonding between manganese and carbon. And so they started a bonding analysis. And uh, this is only important above the Fermi level, which is the zero line, uh, 0.0 line. And uh, the conclusion was there's no 
um, specific uh, sign that there are stronger manganese carbon bonds, that seems to be not relevant. But when we look for the manganese, manganese and iron ion positions in a supercell that is uh, fitted with one carbon uh, atom, then we notice that there is some volume expansion due to the carbon, and that causes a movement of the iron atoms from specific positions and from manganese atoms to specific positions, and especially the movement of the manganese uh, atoms seems to be more favorable than the iron movement. So it's considered that it is the um, manganese, manganese, and the iron ion bonds that are decisive for this specific effect of carbon. Hmm. Yes, I've had to accept that, but what do we learn from that? So we now know that carbon prefers to be in the vicinity of manganese. And does that show any effect for an engineer? Yes, it shows, because we noticed that in these trip steels, in these FCC, in these phase center cubic materials, we found something like a big hardening effect. So an increase in yield strength after low temperature annealing. And that can be most probably explained by the positioning of carbon in the vicinity of um, uh, manganese when uh, dislocation moves through the lattice and transports some carbon with the uh, dislocation movement. And then the carbon atom is jumping back into favorite positions. And that results also in different parameters that are characteristic for this type of baker. But that's only a, a quite simple question. Uh, it becomes more complex if we consider further alloying elements and if we especially uh, expect alloying elements that are not that similar to iron, like manganese, that are really dissimilar from iron, for example, aluminum. And uh, in aluminum, we observe some, I think I've taken too fast. On the right-hand side, there should be a movement now. Yes, now there's a movement. And you see that uh, obviously the uh, aluminum atoms try to find a specific preferred position uh, as uh, second neighbors neighbors. And uh, if we consider the possible options to produce what we call a kappa precipitate, um, then we can calculate many different possible arrangement of atoms that is shown here on the left hand part. And we once again can uh, develop super lattices and try to develop the uh, specific enthalpy of these lattices and see what is the minimum energetic solution. And that results in a specific arrangement of aluminum atoms. And we can also see the energy differences between different positions that allows us to take this energy as a characteristic feature to take some assumptions, I have to say, and then to predict what is the impact on the material properties. And so we can claim that in these high alloy materials, we have uh, so uh, contribution to strengths by solid solution, that's quite clear, uh, by grain size or structuring or, or twin boundaries, that is uh, sigma GS, but we also get a contribution to strengths by short range ordering. And this is not negligible because you see it's in the order of uh, 30 to 80 megapascal, depending a little bit on the uh, specific alloy condition. So that is simulation work. It has been calculated. And um, so many traditional engineers only believe what they can measure. So we tried to measure. We tried to measure uh, ordered arranged uh, areas. And we tried to do that with different techniques. And one of the techniques has been proven to be very effective. That is small angle neutron diffraction. And uh, we used the Munich reactor and uh, did some calculations, uh, did some uh, measurements for high manganese, high aluminum alloyed materials to see the impact on kappa phase formation and uh, how the, does that contribute to strength. And uh, that is shown for a first set of uh, tests here. We had aging at, I have to explain that 600 centigrade uh, for one minute, very short time, uh, 15 minutes, one hour. 
And uh, you see the impact on the mechanical properties, uh, yield strengths in the uh, s quenched condition. And uh, then if we have some aging, we increase the formability, the ductility of the material, and we increase the strengths at the same time. So that's always what we are looking for as in being an engineer. And uh, if you uh, take some longer time, you have a small reduction in uh, strength, but it's uh, in strain, in engineering strain, but that's still uh, on a high level. And we can increase tremendously the yield strength by more or less 400 megapascal. And that is due to short, at least to some extent, also to uh, the short range ordering and the formation of uh, pre-precipitates or later on of precipitates of kappa. And these can be measured and you see the average radius and the number density of these particles. And you see that as a function of the aging conditions and also on the pre-straining. So obviously in pre-strained material, we can obtain extremely small radii of just maybe two nanometer. So if we do some longer aging times, uh, then this becomes an issue and problematic because at longer aging time, we get the classical precipitation behavior at rain boundaries and at triple points. And that uh, is not very effective anymore with respect to yield strength increase, neither to, uh, is not tolerant for uh, ductility anymore. So we get uh, an issue that we don't increase the strength, but we uh, despair the formability. And uh, that goes hand in hand with relatively large precipitates. Now, that's the story of uh, short range ordering. And uh, to sum up this story, uh, we have shown that by precipitation of coherent uh, uh, areas, we can uh, improve the strengths by around about 400 megapascal. Uh, the reduction in total elongation is quite limited. And um, this intermetallic copper phase precipitation can both increase yield strengths, ultimate tensile strengths, and at least maintain, sometimes we even have the impression, improve uh, the total elongation. And to take a very classical picture for uh, the uh, precipitation hardening in uh, microalloy steel, uh, then we can compare the effect of uh, titanium, niobium, vanadium carbides in body-centered cubic microalloy steel and compare that with the kappa impact in uh, FCC in austenite. And we see that, of course, we need much more kappa. We need a higher volume fraction, but we can achieve round about the same type of precipitation harm. Okay, to sum up, it started a little bit with a fairy tale. Uh, and with a simple question, and I already gave the answer. Now it took a long time to give for the second time the same answer. Um, yes, we can develop new fields. We have new ideas. And I try to explain that we need quantitative description of structural features on the nanometer scale. The example was a complex phase steel. Uh, we can use nanostructured steels for better balance, strength, and toughness and fatigue. Uh, I took the example of the forging steels. We have an adjustment of alloy concept and new and old processing routes. I used the advanced high strength steel third generation, the medium manganese steels, to explain that. And finally, we have new simulation tools, for example, up in Isho, new experimental tools, for example, uh, small angle Newton diffraction for much better. Uh, materials understanding. And I think this gives us some optimistic view that we will be able to develop really new materials. So that brings me to the end. I have to thank many of uh, the co-workers and uh, my colleagues here at uh, the Steel Institute or at other institutes in Aachen. And I would like to thank you all for listening. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Black, for uh, this impressive overview of yeah, the relationship between uh, how the microstructure evolves and uh, how properties evolve of steels and what kind of uh, new trends we can think of uh, in developing new steel grades. Thank you very much. That was an impressive uh, overview. And yeah, I would like to open uh, 
this presentation for uh, for discussion. So I will stop the recording and we can, let's say more privately, uh, discuss things further. <laughs>